Awesome. Well, hey, welcome back, everybody, to week two of House Corporation Pain Points. Uh, tonight, we're going to be focused on prioritizing finances. And uh, for those of you I haven't had an opportunity to meet, my name is Scott Fusell. I'm the Director of Education for CSL Management. I'm also a member of Beta Theta Pi, where I, I joined at Middle Tennessee State University, uh, where I had a life-changing fraternity experience and where that experience continues today. So uh, I am big time grateful that you decided to spend some time with us tonight by showing up uh, again every time. That just reveals to us that you care deeply about this experience. You care deeply about the members who call your houses home, and you care deeply about these facilities. You could be anywhere in the world tonight. Uh, it's a beautiful Thursday night for many of us. Uh, there's a lot of places you could be, but you chose to be here with us tonight, and you chose to invest in your own professional or volunteer development. And we are really grateful that you made that decision and you decided to spend some time with us. So thank you for being here and thank you for doing uh, what you do every single day. So with me as usual is Woody Raderman. He's our managing partner here at CSL Management. He's gonna be doing the majority of the heavy lifting tonight. Uh, happens to be a chapter brother of mine at Middle Tennessee State. Um, if you ever ask why we do what we do, it's because the experience that we had at 304 East Lytle uh, really set us on a, a trajectory that uh, was, was pretty extraordinary. So the experiences and the relationships, the community and the connectivity that we experienced there together and with our chapter brothers was pretty extraordinary. And if we can help you provide that same experience for young men and women who are living in your houses, oh man, that's a good day for us. So, uh, so Woody, thanks for being with us tonight. Appreciate you making some time. Good to be here. All right. So as I mentioned earlier, we're going to talk about prioritizing finances tonight, which is something that we all struggle with at some level, uh, or we could be a little bit more proficient at. So we're going to dive into some of the best practices when it comes to processes, talk about some of the things that the pros focus on, uh, and then we're going to get into, and this is going to be really uh, kind of focused on the, the men's group specifically, this this our third topic, and that's gonna be talking about how do we make a house director financially accessible for uh, our organizations that, that badly want a house director but don't have one uh, because they just don't feel like that they can make it happen financially. We're gonna dive into that a little bit, uh, but we wanna get started with a question. We wanna get started with a question, and here it is. And we would love for you to hop over into the chat and share with us. How much of your revenue are you able to, to save each year? So if you're thinking about your, you know, the percentage of your total budget or percentage of your total revenue, what percentage of that revenue are you able to set aside every single year? Hop over into the chat and give us a, uh, give us a response to that question. We'd love to know where that lands for you guys. Pre-COVID, we set aside 5%. Yeah, 10% at best. Yeah, that sounds familiar. Here, yeah, twenty percent. I see a fifty k plus, about thirty thousand. That's ten percent, five to eight percent. Yeah, so we're all somewhere in that five to ten percent range, and uh, with a few bumping up north of uh, of of ten percent. So we're. It's not uncommon when we ask that question to see responses that for, that are all over the board. So. Um, what we want to do tonight is kind of share some ideas, some best practices, some fundamentals that can help maybe standardize uh, those processes across the board and throughout our entire community and maybe give you some things to think about. So if you're at 5%, you can start, you can get to 8%. If you're at 8, you can get to 12. Uh, we would love to help you find a way to set up more side of that budget so you have it on hand so you can invest and you need to. So uh, with that being said, we're going to start off talking about processes. And this is where I turned it over to Woody to do all the heavy lifting. And Woody, uh, thanks again for being with us. Take it away. Thanks, Scott. Um, for some reason, I'm having a, I got a blank screen from you. I don't, does everybody see the PowerPoint? Is it just me that's not seeing it? I see it. Okay. Could be, could be on my end, which is totally fine because we have learned, we were talking about this before you all got online, we have learned to uh, get really skillful on our uh, presentation. So I had it pulled up on another screen and, and doing fine. So I think I, I think what I did, Scott, is 
I was trying to uh, mute uh, everybody and I hit their video. So do you want to hit mute one time so we have everybody muted and I'll unmute? Yeah. Thank you. Perfect. So we've come a long way, Mr. Fusel. A year, a year ago, yes, we'd be in complete panic mode and we just went through that so smoothly. So I'm oh, sorry. No. But, um, it's, in all seriousness, guys, it's really great to be again um, with you again tonight uh, and carrying on our series from last week. And again, just to reset the stage, our goal or our hope when we get through this series and our next one being in two weeks, we really are to a point where we want to start getting back on offense. And what can we do to get back on offense versus all the defense that we've had to play because of the pandemic and get back to those fundamentals and think about some of the things that even as I went through that list and saw all of you and how much you're reserving, and sometimes this is like preaching to the choir because you guys are here tonight and you, you work and do a lot of these things already. But at the same time, even as some of this may be elementary, our goal is, is when you leave this session is that you will sit down as a board or you sit down as a house director in your role and how you're supporting the experience. And are we doing these things? Are we holding ourselves accountable to these basics? Because I can assure you, if you are, uh, everything else will take care of themselves. So tonight we shift to finance. We talk about budgets. And so one of the things that we always are big proponents of and we're working with our clients on are, are the processes. So what processes do we have in place for managing our finances? And if we don't have any, we would encourage you to get processes in place for these four items at a minimum that we have listed here. Do you have a budgetary process? Do you have processes for managing receivables and payables? Do you have a process for planning for major expenses? And do you have a process for reporting? And what are you reporting and why is reporting important? And we're gonna talk about all of that tonight. But one of the things that uh, I wanna really hammer on a little bit is gonna be the budget process in of itself. And think about, if you talk to a lot of financial minded people in the industry out there, accountants, uh, financial planners, all the different uh, elements or careers there are in finance, you'll find a lot of them don't talk about budgeting much anymore. They look at budget as more of a forecasting because the real thing is, is finances are not finite. They don't just, uh, they don't sit still, right? They're always changing. Our finances are always moving. They're always going one way or the, out or one way in they're never stationary. So why do we think from a budgetary standpoint, we set our budget for the year and then we kind of just sit and rest. That's not reality. That budget is living, breathing and changing. So for the budgetary mindset, as we go here in a second and dive a little bit deep into it, start thinking about it as a forecasting tool and something that when you look at it month in and month out, you may have a 12 month budget, but we get our August numbers and we plug those numbers in. Those are real numbers that we can now reset our budget. We have our real numbers for August for our fiscal year budgets, June 3rd or July 1st to June 30th. We have July and August real, plug those in and base those on our forecasted numbers for September through May and continue to move that month, every month going down and getting those real numbers so that when you're looking at things, you're at least seeing uh, in real time where things are uh, getting off kilter. So just as you look at your processes in all these areas, and we'll talk a little bit more about each one of them, I think a real key for any of this and what we're talking about tonight is think about everything we do is can continuous. It's always moving forward. It's always changing. There's nothing that's stationary. And if you find yourself that you haven't looked at any of these items on this list, or you haven't done anything in the stuff that we're talking about for 30, 45 plus days, you're getting behind the ball and you need to have a process to make sure that at least at some point in time, continuously we're touching these areas. So Scott, let's go to the next slide and talk about the budgets. And, and just here are just some high level key elements that we talk through and look at from time to time uh, on the budget process uh, that we're looking at. One thing we always like to talk about, as we talked about last week, we need to start thinking about how we manage our facilities uh, and the, all the opportunities within managing a chapter house as a learning opportunity for our undergraduate members. And so we always wanna make sure that even in the budgetary process, where it's appropriate and some of the information you may not feel is appropriate and that's fine, but the more that we can use these opportunities to engage with our undergraduate members and include them in the process, we're just helping them uh, better develop, 
become better citizens, part of our mission of our organization. So never lose that opportunity as you're going through your budgets and you're setting stuff. It's really important for our members to understand why things cost like they do and where where the money is going, right? Uh, with the, with what is appropriate. So don't lose that opportunity. Hey, On the Woody, revenue, can I, add well, there? can I add something really quickly to that, Woody? Yeah. Yeah, I, I think one of the other, I love everything you just said about the development opportunity for students, but I, I think one of the other things that that enables them to do is to take some ownership. Uh, people sure. support what they help create. And if they're engaged in the process, uh, man, just, just think about how much more ownership they're going to have in managing the revenue and having a better understanding of what it is. And it's also going to help us if we're engaging them in, in the process, it's going to help us better understand you know, where they want us to spend. I mean, we think about that, that story from uh, Beta Theta Pi at Oklahoma. You know, they, they, were, they were very, the students were just absolutely critical in determining where they invested in that house when they uh, uh, reconstructed it essentially uh, five years or so ago. So it's, uh, I love that there's a developmental piece, but there's also that ownership piece and helping them be a part of the process as well that I think is so important. And for us as alums, uh, we all, oftentimes think that we know exactly what they want and where we should be investing. Boy, it's, it's really good to have their input, to make sure we're spending money where they really, really want it as well. So love that, that whole first bullet. Sorry to interrupt you there. Just want nope, to add that. Good. Nope, no problem. So, and then when we talk about in the budget, obviously we've got our revenue and our expenses and, and on the revenue front, just a couple of additional, I know we hit on some of this last week as well. Always the reminder, you know, we, we talk about room and board, right, as, a, as big drivers of our revenue and, and where that's coming from. But some of the areas, again, I always say it and if I always have an opportunity, it's 90 to 95 percent uh, is a, a minimum goal, if, we, if you will, of what room and board is being charged at the university is where our fees should be based. Um, and, and again, we want to make it affordable, but we also want to make sure that we're charging enough that's going to allow us to maintain these facilities for uh, into the future or into perpetuity, hopefully. But when we talk about, you know, we talk 90, 95%, we have our out of house fees as well. I think that's one area that's always comes up for discussion. Um, and, and, and it really gets more driven by the market and what our competition is doing. And I understand that. And we certainly can appreciate, we can't price ourselves out of the market, but when you look at your revenue and you look at the figures you're sitting, your expenses are what your expenses are and your future needs are going to be those future needs. And you know that they're coming at some point in time. We talk about all the time in the, in 20 to 30 years, you've basically reinvested everything into a facility and only things that last beyond 30 years. And even that can be a stretch uh, in this day and age, but certainly the slate roofs uh, are about, about as much as we see uh, that lasts anything beyond 30 years in a facility. So we have to be prepared and understand the fact that over the next 20 or 30 years, we're going to basically rebuild this house outside of the structure and maybe the roof, depending on the material. So that should be our driver of revenue. We need to be sensitive of the market for sure, but we need to be looking at what our realistic expenses are and what the future capital needs are going to be when we're setting the revenue. And I also think we, we need to be looking at the market value beyond just what the university is, right? And what apartments are and things of that nature so that you have some litmus tests and you've done your homework. So if people are asking, you know, where are these coming from? You can give them an answer uh, that uh, is very transparent and, and makes a lot of sense. That is basically what they're looking for oftentimes when they're questioning why things cost what they do. I think the other aspect of it is looking at the, the sources and how your where your revenue is coming from and have we done it equally in terms of, of every opportunity we have, whether it's the room, whether it's food, whether it's parking, whether it's the out of house members, whatever it may be. And are we spreading that uh, equally and appropriately? And are we taking advantage of the opportunities where if parking is typically charged because we may be in a more of a metro city environment, then you need to be charging for parking and not missing on that type of revenue. Uh, that is just something that is a custom. Now, if you're on a land grant university and there's land everywhere, then in parking on university is only about a hundred bucks. Well, your, your competition probably isn't charging that. So it's really important to do the research and understand where those sources are. And I would say, you know, when we talk about rent, well, sometimes what we see is we're putting a lot of burden 
on the people who are actually living in the house versus, versus those who are living out in terms of the rent aspects or, of course, the ones living out, out of house fee, CAM or whatever it may be that you want to call it, common area maintenance fee, is to, to really think through some of that because those out of house members, right, and we talk about right now, we want to get our occupancy back up. We want to keep occupancy numbers where they are. You know, sometimes it's maybe better to incentivize people to live in versus living out. Uh, you can't do it out of house fees so much to a detriment uh, from a competitive standpoint. I get it. But do we have too much unnecessary burden on those that are living in the house? And could we put a little bit more of that burden of those who are living out who by and large are, are getting a lot of the same usage out of the facility as those living in? So those are just always good conversations to relook and understand on the revenue front across all mediums and where you're seeing uh, price sensitivity, where you see market shifts and making sure that you're just staying uh, where you need to be from the revenue side. On the expenses, three areas that we common are seeing challenges. One is one's on legacy issues. I can't tell you how many times when we have the opportunity to bring on a new client and we start digging into the expenses, how many phone lines that they may still be paying for that never haven't had a phone tagged to them in 10 years. Uh, cable cable boxes that are no longer in the house or anywhere and we have no cable. Uh, so the utilities are a really great front to look at from a leg, what we call legacy issues where we may have had these services in the past. We've gotten rid of the equipment. We've thought we've discontinued and that one, that 20 modems, if you will, that you're sitting getting charged for, for uh, internet service that you no longer have on your cable bill because you switched it somewhere else. You need to be looking at those and researching those things. I mean, there is a whole industry, whole companies out there that will come and say, hey, if you let us look at all your bills, uh, we will guarantee you we're going to save you X. We're going to take a percentage of it over the next three years for those savings. But it's simply because no one's willing to do the work or make the phone calls or negotiate. And that goes to point number two is we get comfortable, right? We, we get all these agreements in place. We're uh, comfortable with what we're paying on different things and we're not doing the work. Point number three, sometimes to renegotiate those agreements to call to see if there's deals, if there's way to bring those expenses down because it's just easier if we got the money to pay for it and move on. And so there's typically opportunities in those expenses uh, to find revenue, if you will, to cut our expenses and to add to that bottom number. And I mean, kudos to every one of you on this that are able to save 10% or more every year, because that's really the goal. The two, the two theories that are out there in order to be prepared for CapEx and reserves in the future needs for this facility, we need to either be saving at least 10% of revenue, or we need to be uh, saving about 2% of the building's value. So those are two formulas that are normally used. So you can use those as litmus tests to see how you're doing on those fronts. But oftentimes we forget that just doing a little homework on our expenses, you will be fine. You will be surprised at how much money you can find. Scott, let's go to the next slide. So on, on this one, we want to kind of give you, as Scott said, we we're talking about you know, what the pros. So those who are doing a, a, a typically a really good job on their finances and, and have their house in order, if you will, where we're seeing the focus areas are in these five places. This is where they continue to uh, consistently perform and have a process in place to make sure that they do in these areas. So first is collection. So again, we've talked about revenue, how much time and effort are we putting in to making sure that those re or rents or uh, revenue that is due that is beyond 30 days, what's your process for making sure that you stay on them and you get the money in? Again, a big common theme that we see when we start working with folks and getting into their finances, we have all of these receivables out there. And right now, you know, our accounting team is going after receivables that are five, six, seven years past due thinking that there's no way to get it and we're getting money in. So it's, do you have the discipline and, and no one likes it, right? This is probably the least favorite thing that we like to do at all within our organizations is the accountability front. These are our brothers, our sisters. We think they're going to pay. Why wouldn't they pay uh, that whole aspect of it? It's just uncomfortable and I totally get it, but we need to have the discipline to stay on it and make sure that those who uh, have not paid will pay. Uh, it's that simple. 
Uh, on the CapEx planning portion of it, we always like to think again, as I stated earlier, sometimes we put a five-year plan together. We know next year we're gonna hit the boiler. That's what we're gonna do to get it fixed. You crank up the boiler in November, winter comes, it doesn't start up. Now you're changing your boiler in November. It's not next year, it's now. Now what do you do? Well, in us, it's a continuous process. You need the minute that boiler is replaced, you need to pull out that CapEx plan. You need to move that boiler to 15 to 20 years down the road, and you need to reallocate all your funds and see where you are in your reserve. And again, look at it in real time so that you're capturing that and that allows you to continue to make the best decisions when things come up. You guys know, and I'm preaching to the choir on this call, there's something's going to come up all the time. So it's best that in real time that we're talking through these things and we're making the notes and we're contributing to all of our plans to account for these changes and that we're documenting them. Expense, the big thing about expense is the controls. Controls in terms of what we're looking at and who's watching the bills. And when we see a bill and it doesn't look right, we have the control and process in place to actually look at that bill, go to that vendor, figure out what is going on. We had a situation one time where we're working with a national partner, all their utility bills went to them because they always wanted to make sure that they were paid and that was great. And if there were an anomaly, they would come back to us and we would go dig. Well, one of the uh, newer members of their team didn't know this facility very well and kept paying a $7,000 water bill on a house that normally had about $200. They had six people that lived there. Well, finally through an audit, someone said, hey, why did we go from 200 a month to 7,000? Now, fortunately, we were able to get the water company to refund most of it because it was a main water line uh, that they were responsible for, but no one caught it. So making sure you have good controls to catch those different things is important. But then it's also, controls on how we're writing our checks and how many people have access to the checks and who do we know who's spending the money and where uh, obviously is a big thing that we hear from our insurance partners quite a bit and making sure you have proper controls there. Reporting, this is an area where we very, very rarely do we see many people have the discipline to do the continuous reporting. Every month, run the reports, make sure you have a P&L statement, a profit and loss, your income and expense is what it's cost sometimes as well. And you're reviewing it, how you did this month versus 12 months prior. And then also taking those numbers into the forecasting, like I mentioned earlier, a balance sheet, looking at your liability, assets and liabilities, do the reconciliation of the checking account. It's making sure everything lines up. Those reports are our crystal ball. We wish we all had that magic crystal ball all the time. If you're not looking at the reports and looking at the information, the data in real time, you're never going to have it. So have the discipline and have that information available to you on the reporting side so you can see those trends and see hopefully as quickly and as far in advance as you can where you might have a pitfall or you may have an issue. And then lastly, reserves equal cash, right? We all know it. Cash is what? It's king. And we know it's king. And we talked about this last 12 months, right? Everybody, I mean, it was an amazing process in April and May and seeing how the industry responded and everyone really started putting the brakes on and making sure that we were reserving cash and being prepared. And it's paid off. I mean, we still took a hit, right? We know in the industry around 15% uh, is where everyone landed. Some were worse, some were better but we took about a 15% hit and that's pretty, that's a pretty strong hit uh, overall, but at the same time, we're still here and we're still moving forward. So you can never lose sight on the reserving and the saving. And if you can't get to that 10% or that 2% of the building's value, you need to figure out a way to do it. Scott, next slide. Let's see. You know, one of the things that Scott had alluded to uh, going into this, and this is a trend that we've really started to see quite a bit on in the last 12 to, to really 18 months, is the whole need and the concept of a house director in facility, especially on the men's side of the equation. Obviously, for the house directors that are on this call, uh, certainly, hopefully, you know and recognize how much we value the process or the of having you in the house and value what you bring to the overall experience to the members that are there we think it's invaluable when it's done right. And so in that same scenario though, we're now 
if we look at the men's side of the equation, and this relates somewhat somewhat to the women as well, we had to take in our women's chapters as well, took on a lot of expenses that aren't customary or we're paying for stuff more than they've ever paid for. So it's not like we don't always have pressures on our budget, but certainly on the men's side of the equation, we have bringing in services to the house that we've sometimes outsourced, if you will, to our own members that were willing to mow the lawn, clean the house, do whatever. And we're adding more and more expenses to our facilities when we're already having the depressed revenue and we haven't been charging enough and we can't just yank it up in one year, right? So we've talked over the year, we've talked about that quite a bit. So how do you, as you look at it and you're at a university like Miami of Ohio that 18 months ago, said at their December meeting, they gave everybody nine months, you got to have a house director at, at a men's facility. We're rolling out our sophomore initiative. And for you to have sophomores living in your facility as part of their two-year commitment to live on campus, you got to have a house director. Okay, well, oh, well, what does that mean? And how do I have to pay for it? And I don't have a house director suite. Now I've got to retrofit the building and everything else. We think it's really important when we talk about finance and we talk about what we're seeing in the future, we're seeing that more and more folks, uh, whether it's the campus is going to be requiring it, national organizations on the men's side bringing it as an initiative, especially for those facilities that sleep 25 or more where the finances start working to where you can bring in typically a house director, that that requirement's coming uh, and you need to be prepared for it and you need to be thinking about it. Outside the fact it's a great opportunity, whether you're required or not, looking at a house director and being able to have them on site, yeah. there's a lot of benefits that go with it. So in that, what do you need to start looking at? So for us, what, again, what we see is that there could be mandates and there's certainly shifting priorities uh, as it relates to uh, what we want that experience to that's unveiling in our houses, what we want it to look like. And for it to get to the level that we all hope and aspire to, that house director can certainly expedite that, but it costs money uh, in significant dollars in some situations. So how do we incorporate it when you're asking us to do all these other things or bring in professional management like us and all the different elements? So there is no magic bullet. Of course, I feel like the attorney, again, when you ask an attorney an opinion, they always say it depends. It feels like when people ask us about money or a situation, we always say there's no magic bullet. Uh, so there's not in this situation, but there's a couple of things that you can be getting creative on and looking at. So the type of house director, right, is you're looking at it and on your campus. And if you're trying to bring in the role uh, and understanding what type of house directors are in other facilities or if there's never been house directors in your other facilities, you might want to start uh, what I would call a, a little bit on the light end in terms of maybe it's a grad student that is looking for a place to stay and might be able to help for a while, but it's more of a part-time environment or someone that has a full-time job outside of the facility, but they can be there during key periods. So understanding if you can't go right off to a full-time live in, we've got to work through our uh, facility and all those different things. You can certainly get creative of the type and the role and they don't necessarily have to live there right off the beginning. Could you have someone that could come by at night uh, at least five times a week or whatever it may be, or check on them in the morning when they're going to work uh, and coming back and just staying interactive and serving somewhat more of that alumni engagement role because we don't have alums in the areas. There's a lot of campuses out there, right? When we graduate, they're smaller rural areas and most of our alums uh, move out. So thinking and getting creative on the type and role of house director might help you start moving toward that needle. Compensation, how can we get creative on compensation? Are we okay if they have a part-time job or even a full-time job outside of the house? Can we go beyond just room and board? Um, where are just some different ways or initiatives that we can to do it? It doesn't necessarily mean you gotta start out with a salary right away, uh, full time and looking at all of those different elements. Think about what could we do to incentivize that might inform the type of house director you're able to afford early on. But again, I think you can get creative and provide some different options outside of just a full time compensation, a salary. You know, one area that we're working on uh, quite a bit on some of our campuses with our men's groups is sharing a house director. Uh, we have one campus in particular where one of our men's facilities newly renovated, 
uh, it's a reestablished chapter, so they don't have a ton of men yet, but they want, because they've just invested millions of dollars into their chapter house, they want to have someone there pretty quickly, but they can't really take on the full salary on their own. So we're working with, hey, we have three other men's groups on that campus. None of them have a house director, but they would love to have more and more oversight on a daily basis. Let's talk about if the house director can live in your facility and we can share that cost amongst three groups and we can share the, the resources of a house director, which you can uh, certainly uh, set that up. That is what we're working on is a great opportunity to be able to use the house director versus outside of just one facility. This is a campus where the men's groups house about 25 to 30 uh, young men in each facility. It's not necessarily a 60, 80 person uh, facility like the sorority houses there that take a ton of time. So getting creative and being able to maybe to share a house director is certainly one if uh, set up properly, it can be very effective. Um, you know, the last piece of it, when we always talk about we can't afford it, we always go, especially on the men's side of the equation, and we say, let's look at your repair and maintenance for the year and how much money you have spent on fixing this building up over the last five years. And if you could be introducing a house director to live in that facility, and if that house director can reduce that by 15 or 20 percent, and if they're doing a really good job, they probably can reduce that by 50 percent. Nine times out of 10, did we not all even find the money? We just saved them money because they were spending so much on the wear and tear aspects of it. So we have to sometimes think creative on that uh, aspect of it and look at the b broader picture and realizing, yeah, you may have to pay 35, 40, 45, 50, whatever it may be, depending on the areas or where you are or the compensation or however it may be. But at the end of the day, look at what you're spending in repairs and maintenance and other costs and you will see by and large, uh, they're gonna be able to hopefully save you money by working with the members and, and doing a better job of maintaining that facility. So with that, that was our story for tonight on the financial front. And again, <laughs> what I wanna make sure uh, everybody understands on this is that last week and this week, a lot of what you've heard, I'm sure for many of you, You've probably heard before or in, in different environments, but what we are doing, what we do day in and day out and in our facilities, it doesn't, it's not a dynamic market where it's shifting all the time in terms of what we have to do. But what is shifting and what is dynamic are the different market forces that hit our day-to-day -day activity within our houses. And that requires discipline and requires uh, consistency and what we're doing in day in that day in and day out with our processes, that allows us to be nimble enough to take whatever the market is bringing us. So, our whole goal as we come out of this and looking to the future is that we get back on offense, and we hope that we can do that. And I know Scott's going to share a little bit with you about what we'll talk about in the town hall in two weeks. So, Scott, yeah. I'll give it back to you. Awesome, thank you, Woody. Appreciate it. Um, hey, we've uh, we. We want to spend some time. We've got uh, in the in the remaining minutes we have left. Uh, want to open it up to some questions. We've had a couple come in in the chat, and I would encourage you if you've got some questions over what Woody's covered tonight, uh, please feel free to hop in the chat, and I'll field those questions there, and uh, and or I'll share them with Woody there, and we'll just continue to knock those out up until as long as we need to. But uh, I will say uh, early on, uh, Debbie Friedman asked a quick question. She's asking. Now, how do you recommend uh, an out-of-house fee, Woody? You know, what's, is that a flat fee? Is that a per percentage? How exactly do you determine what that might be? Well, I think there's, I don't know many people, Debbie, that do it on a percentage. It is typically a flat fee, you know, semester, per semester type deal. What we would say and look at now, I would say on the, on the lowest end, excuse me, that we see for houses is, you know, a hundred bucks a semester maybe 200 a, a year. If you're below that and out of the house fee and you have a 5,000 square foot house or bigger, you really need to be looking at it and understanding what the rest of the market is. But the biggest driver that we've always seen when we talk to people about out of house fees is what everybody else is charging. Well, what's our neighbor charging or what's that organization charging? And there's no real science uh, to it at all in terms of how they're setting it outside of 
they got the report from the fraternity sorority life and this is what everybody else is charging so that's what we're going to charge what i would again look at your are your expenses by and large for most facilities are fairly fixed there are going to be variations obviously variable expenses on your repairs and maintenance and different items but a large majority of that budget's fixed so we know what our expenses are and we got to get to that 10 percent so we have that figure well room and board if we go back and we look at what the recommendation is is 90 to 95 percent where are we sitting on that is there a way that we can move that up or we need to change it maybe we're too high whatever that number is apply that to your expenses what's left over right and what we've got to do then we look at do we have parking do we have other areas or resources and then really our, our other aspect of it is the out of house fee and how many members do we have out of the house Divide it into that number that's left to get you to your 10 percent is that within market is that where we need to be is it way off of where it should be uh, but getting that number at least as close to that as possible while still being competitive in the market is how we look at it but it's typically a flat fee based on you know what where we are shortages between the room and board uh, what other revenue opportunities we have, and then what the market is charging out there. Thank you, Woody. Uh, yeah. Susan's asking a question about house directors, but there are a couple that came in right after hers that are along these same lines. So I want to, I'm going to come back to Susan's question on house director in just a second. But uh, Charles, I think Woody just answered your question. Uh, if he didn't, uh, shoot me a quick message and I'll, uh, we'll ask for some clarification. But Evan's asking, you know, what about <laughs> This is an interesting one. What about introducing out of house fees for a chapter that's never had them? How do you go yeah. about that? Yeah. So I can tell you real quick on Charlie's answer again, what I said, low end is normally a couple hundred bucks a year on the high end. We have seen really about a thousand to fifteen hundred dollars a year. But I would say that the determinations on that and think about it, too. Those are just the fees. Now, if you're charging board, if you're your food, right, that's in addition to just the out of house fee. So if they're doing a food plan or whatever, we see some like, I know like the University of Alabama, that is a big scenario in what they do. So you could see someone paying $500 a month or $5,000 a year that doesn't even live in the house, but they have a full meal plan included in that. So I'm talking just a straight common area maintenance out of house fee and what you're looking at. And I would say a house that's 15,000 plus square feet that's sleeping, 35, 40 folks, you have good common area space, things of that nature, you need to be charging 500, if not more, a, a, um, a semester for the use of that. Think of a country club facility and, and how much access they have. Now, there is a fair argument if your house is 10 miles away from campus and I live out of house and I'm not there as much, they may have a fair argument at it, but at the end of the day, what drives it is your budget. Um, as it relates to, I've never charged before, what do I do? Well, it's a conversation with the chapter first and foremost, and you need to educate them why this is important. Gentlemen or ladies, you do not live in this facility. However, you get to benefit from the use of this facility, study rooms, kitchen, social events, whatever it may be, common area, and those common areas require maintenance and expenses year in and year out, including property taxes and everything else. It is not fair that that is borne 100% by those members who live in the facility. To that end, we are going to introduce an out-of-house fee starting whenever and explain how you came up with that value going through everything we just went through tonight and looking at the market, and you do it. And, and it's as it's, it's, it's simple as that. Now, will you get pushed back in different things? No, absolutely. You can't go in there and charge the highest than anybody else on campus is charging or whatever. But you educate, you come in there, you have your data, and you do what you need to do to make sure you're maintaining that facility. And you may ask uh, those who are living in to help you build that argument because uh, they're not uh, going to be too thrilled about uh, carrying the weight for, of everybody else anyway. So uh, they, you might want to get them on your team. So uh, yeah. good stuff there. Uh, Susan's asking a great question here and about, you know, she's got a full-time house director who's exempt from overtime. Uh, Department of Labor is requiring a minimum of 54000 a year starting in January, and that's way beyond their budget. Is there a way to get creative without breaking the law? Well, I mean, you have to be really 
careful here um, because there are there are skilled people and we have house directors that have done this unfortunately in some regards but you have to be and it doesn't have to be a house director there's just people skilled period that are paid hourly or they know the uh, labor laws is what they do they look to use them as their advantage right uh, and we can tell stories of um, house directors and not again just house directors as of employees that have documented for years their after hours that they weren't getting paid but they weren't saying anything to the employer only to file a pretty big lawsuit and win 11 out of 10 times so it's very tricky and you have to be very careful here so i would recommend i mean that there's there's not a lot of ways around it and we would just encourage i know uh taking them uh when you have to hit those three lit litmus tests for them to be exempt it can be tough uh, and to justify it within a house director's role. And it's not fun to the employer and it's not fun to the employee to have to start tracking hours and looking at it. But I would encourage you, if you can't answer those three questions and, and feel free to reach out afterwards and we can talk through it more. Uh, and we have to be careful we're not attorneys or HR professionals. We just know enough to be deadly. But if you can't hit all those three litmus tests, you, know, you really need to be looking at the hourly and tracking the hours, but there's some ways to make it easier and to, to be reasonable on it. But I think it's just important that there's open and honest dialogue on that because you can get into a very dangerous and slippery slope if you're not as working with your house director transparently with it and then back to you. Uh, we've seen it work, not come out very well for either party sometimes. And Susan, I hope I answer that. And again, that's a that's a pretty complex question. Uh, so please feel free to reach out and be happy to talk more in depth with you because we have studied that quite a bit in partnership with our clients and can try to help you navigate that as best as possible. Uh, Virginia's asking if uh, if if we're certain that the, the new DOJ, DOJ rules laws have gone through for sure. Have we gotten um, definite that's happening i have not now granted uh just because i haven't heard anything on doesn't mean that they have uh haven't uh i have not seen anything come through with an absolute on the the updated changes to it i think they're certainly with the election and the results of the election the thought process with well, those would be coming back uh up pretty quickly um uh, but uh, what we're seeing there's not a lot of activity yet but uh, I'm assuming that's probably more of just the presumption, uh, but there certainly could have been an announcement and we just haven't seen it yet. Okay, good deal. Well, we'll, we'll keep an eye out for that one. And as we learn more and uh, hear more as we learn, as we hear more and as we learn more, we'll do the best we can to keep the community updated on that. Uh, and we would also ask, uh, obviously we're doing the best we can to consume as much information as we can. But if you hear something that maybe we haven't shared, well, we would love to hear from you. Uh, you will hear me say early and often that none of us know as much as all of us. So we don't feel like we've got a monopoly on all the information or, or on good ideas. So uh, if there's something that you're learning that we haven't shared from with uh, with the community, boy, we would love to hear from you so we can share it with more folks. So, so uh, uh, Scott, real quick. Yeah. Um, I don't know if we have another question. I know Charles threw out another question related to if the chapter doesn't support out of house fees in their bylaws. I think it's one of the great points that Scott made earlier in this presentation is uh, people will support what they uh, help create. So I, it, I would encourage you to get a little, if, depending on how much work and feel free to reach out after this call as well of communication and working with the leadership and the chapter to understanding why we have to do these things and why it's important that we get this stuff uh, in place uh, financially for the long term of the facility. And if you bring them to the table, allow them to help create, they're a lot more likely to support it moving forward. Mm -hmm. Yep, yep. Uh, that was the last question we had there. So <laughs> I, I do want to give everybody uh, a quick, uh, look ahead to what's going on and and woody thank you again for sharing tonight and thanks to everybody for showing up and really appreciate these questions it's a uh, the financial piece is always uh it is something that we i think we always tend to struggle with in this community and 
because there is that fine line between running it a, running it as a business and these are um, this is a, a membership based organization so there's you know it's it's tough sometimes but um, I appreciate you guys all dialing in tonight and kind of giving us some additional attention so our next session on this topic is going to be not next Thursday but the Thursday after that so we'll take next week off and then we'll come back and wrap up this series uh, with house corporation pain points with a ha uh, town hall style uh, format session and we'll have three experts one on supply chain one on finance one on construction uh, all of which are uh, hot button topics right now within our industry so they'll share a little bit about what the state of the industry is for them but would encourage each of you to to, to bring all of your uh your questions to to that session because uh you know they're going to be teed up to they they know full well that they'll be peppered with questions for the majority of the hour hour and 15 so uh so please if you have questions on supply chain finance or or construction uh you're not going to want to miss uh our session two weeks from now when we get into that town hall style yeah. and uh, scott if i can just put a plug here um guys i i would get this is we're going to do our best uh to really bring the questions in advance too on just some of the stuff that we're seeing in the market i don't know how much of you right now are working through some even summer projects or even major projects uh as you've known or i think i mentioned last week in the last 35 40 days we've seen wood just go crazy you can actually do steel framing for as about as much as wood now uh, i was on a call today on a construction project and there's a uh, expectation that wood again will go up about another 35 percent net percent from where it all already is now keep in mind you could get one sheet of wall board for about 10 bucks a board uh, at the end of January, and it's now over $31 a board. And they're saying it's going to go up another 35% on the wood products by June. The other aspect of it, too, that no one really saw coming was all the weather in Texas and petroleum. So you think about what petroleum is in in every product that is out there, glue, all the different uh, plastics and things that they have in the construction world really took a hit uh, in uh, back in uh when the winter storm hit so we wanted to make sure because we know we have a lot of pent-up demand even within our industry i think if you ever been on any of our calls before in that now we talked about uh, back in may when the pandemic hit just in our small little company and we're not big i'll tell you we took off 25 million in construction work that was going to take place in, two, in the in the next two years just with us. So you think about the pit up demand within our entire market, plus what the world is seeing, it's just, there's a lot of disruption that is out there that's going on and a lot of impact. So we wanted to bring these guys to the table. We're going to really try to give some thought to some of their opening statements and questions. Scott doesn't even know this, but our supply chain partner that we're having bringing to the table, some of you may know Brian Hyder and culinary consultants and their group purchasing, but Brian's working to bring one of the leading uh, supply analysts for one of their big uh, suppliers to the call themselves uh, so we can hear directly from somebody that's behind the scene. So I feel like it's going to be a really valuable discussion. And to Scott's point, please, please bring your questions. Tell your friends. It's something that we're really trying to make sure that it's bringing some real life answers and some real time uh, insight to what's going on as we hit the summer months and, and we continue to try to think through our projects that we've put on the sidelines. That's going to be a great session. Yeah, no, I appreciate that preview, Woody. Thank you for those insights. And uh, I love uh, Amy. The last note I'll hit on in the chat is Amy just mentioned that there's a, a house corporation president's Facebook that she's created. And if you want to join that, uh, her email address is right there in the chat. So uh, love that uh, we can provide sessions like this that can help uh, create additional connections. And uh, if we can connect you with content or connect you with other folks, boy, those that's a that's a good day for us. So with that being said, I, I do want to say until we get together again in two weeks, please feel free to stay in touch. If you have questions, uh, comments, feedback, uh, man, I wish you'd cover this, ideas, any of those topics, uh, please feel free to reach out to us. Our email addresses and phone numbers are on the board there. You can see those. 
Uh, and if you just want to stay in touch with us via social or online, uh, you can see our social channels there, Facebook, uh, Twitter, and Instagram. You can also connect with us at cslmanagement.com. The last thing I will share with you, though, is uh, we, uh, we've we talked about house directors tonight. And, and if we can get somebody on site in your facility all day, every day, boy, that's ideal. Uh, and if you have one of those folks, uh, if you're lucky enough to have a house director that's supporting your facility and you want to grow, uh, you want to build into them and grow their capabilities in a meaningful way uh, would encourage you to take a look at the uh, the information we have up on our website now our csladvance.com website on uh, the 2021 house directors conference that uh, we'll be having in denver uh, there is a, our speakers are there our lineup is there our schedule is there and there will be some additional uh, add-ons to what you can see there um, in, the, in the coming weeks so I would encourage you to take a look at that because we've got an incredible experience planned for Denver this summer and would love uh, uh, would love for you to, to, to invest in your house director in that way. And I did see a question pop up. Yeah, the house directors conference is for both sorority and fraternity house directors. So it's for anybody that wears that hat of house director, we would love to have you there. So, um, and yes, there will be also be a virtual option. So, um, if you have any other questions on the house director conference, I would love for you to reach out to me uh, at scott at cslmanagement.com or if you want to give me a call, my number is right here, 317-376-3793. Would be more than happy to have that conversation with you and, and tell you more about the conference, what our outcomes are, uh, are desired, uh, what outcomes we're hoping to, to leave, to hope you leave with and, um, and, and what we hope that our participants leave with what we hope that they 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 leave and go home uh, better equipped to uh, to support your facilities in a really meaningful way. We got a great experience. Plan. So that being said, I'll say thank you again for joining us tonight. We really appreciate you guys being with us. Great questions, great engagement, and great information again from Woody. So that being said, I'll say again thank you for being with us tonight, and we'll see you next time on House and Home. Take care, everybody. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank thank you. you.